What does it look like to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? Today on Gospel in Life, Tim Keller continues a sermon series examining how a grace-based gospel perspective for justice is the perfect answer to that question. After listening to today's message, be sure to follow Gospel in Life on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for more encouragement from God's Word. Now, here's today's message. The scripture is from Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 to 6 and verse 20. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them. Be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. At that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. This is God's word. We're looking at the Ten Commandments, and we're getting to the, today, to the Ninth Commandment, which I always tend to, I always tend to hear all the commandments, you know, in Cecil B. DeMille tones, uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I don't know if you remember, there was a, there was a sort of a little pillar of fire, and these little comets were coming out of it into the stone tablets in the Cecil B. DeMille movie, uh, Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and, uh, and in spite of how famous these Ten Commandments are, in spite of the fact that these are, the, this is the most, by far, uh, influential ethical set of directions in the history of the world, most of us, A, don't know exactly what each commandment act requires, And B, even fewer of us know how to get the power to be able to actually and practically live as the commandments require. Now, we're going to take a look here at the ninth commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And as we look at what the text tells us, we'll see three things. We learn what people need, why they need it so much, and how you can become the kind of person that gives it to them. What people need, why they need it so much, and how you can become the kind of person that gives it to them. First, what people need. This commandment tells us that people need, above everything else perhaps, truthful speech acts. Speech acts of truth. What do I mean by that? See that little word, false The Hebrew word that's translated into English, false, actually would be a little better translated vain or worthless. And it's a word that includes false speech, but actually it goes a little beyond that, and that's important. In the last 25 years, uh, in North America and Europe, uh, there has been a movement that's called Speech Act Theory. And Speech Act Theory recognizes that words are also actions. And therefore, statements can not only be or should not only be evaluated on as to what they say, but what they do or what they intend to do. So, for example, to say, that is a gorgeous outfit. You look fabulous. That may be true. May be true. But is that speech designed to build up and affirm a hurting person, or to manipulate or even seduce a needy person? What kind of speech act is it? Or, I'll give it to you, let me give you another example of this. Let's just say X and Y know that Z did not rob the bank. X and Y know Z didn't rob the bank. But X says, when questioned, Z robbed the bank. <laughs> but Y says, well... All I know is that Z was coming out of the bank at the time of the robbery. Now, X is lying. That is a factually inaccurate statement. But Y 
is giving a factually accurate statement that misleads. Y is giving a technically truthful statement, which is a false speech act. Because what you actually have is a factually accurate misrepresentation. It's factually accurate, but it misleads. And now we begin to realize how nuanced and profound the Ninth Commandment is and what it really begins to demand of us. Your neighbor does not only need for you not to tell lies. Of course, he needs, she needs that. But it's not enough simply to give factually accurate statements so that you can say to yourself, well, I didn't really lie. Your neighbor needs that you never use the facts in a misleading way to advantage yourself and harm them. And what this means is that when you indulge in political speech, when you do advertising or marketing, when you report to your investors, when you give customers information about your products, when you report to superiors, when you report to inferiors, you must not only not lie, but you mustn't do selective, factually accurate, but misrepresenting uh, statements either. And we do. And we're swimming in it. But we can go even further. If you begin to understand, it's that what's, what is uh, forbidden here is not just lying, but factually accurate, misleading statements. Then we begin, well, let's go a little further. <clears throat> if you try to tell a friend or a family member about their flaws. And those flaws are really there. But you do it in such an abusive way, with such bad timing, that the very truth they need to hear, they're going to resist and they're going to resent. And in other words, if you tell people the truth in such a way that makes it almost necessary for them to reject the truth, you are being a false, worthless, vain witness. It's a sin to tell people the truth in a way that they're going to reject because your intention is not to persuade, to punish, to beat them up, not to help them, but to harm them. Or churches, there are churches that are telling people the truth. They are expounding biblical doctrine and it's factually accurate. But the intention of their speech is not to persuade and it's not to edify. It's to punish, it's to condemn, it's to draw lines to say, we're the good people and you're the bad people. And as a result, it's a vain, worthless witness. Speak the truth and do the truth. Don't lie, don't exaggerate, don't spin. Don't make claims that you know you're really not going to be able to make good on. Don't withhold truth when you know it's requisite. You just clam up. Don't be a vain, worthless, false witness. That's what people need for you to be a true witness. Now, why do people need that so much? Now, here's the second question or a second point. That's what people need. But now, why do they need it so much? Uh, the form of this commandment is a social one. If you look at the commandments before, I know we didn't print them out, but you know them. You shall not lie. I mean, pardon me, it doesn't say you shall not lie. It says you shall not murder, straight up. You shall not commit adultery, straight up. You shall not steal, straight up. But why doesn't it just say you shall not lie, straight up? Why does this commandment go out of the way to, in a sense, paint a picture and bring the neighbor in and therefore stress the point of human community? Because that's what this commandment is all about. That's what it is all about. Um, for reasons I don't realize, I don't know, but in studying this, I, I came to find that both in Exodus and in, in Deuteronomy, in, in the uh, Ninth Commandment, there's a word, a Hebrew word, that English translations totally ignore. It says here, right, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Literally, the Hebrew says, you shall not answer your neighbor with false testimony. And... Um, that word answer means to respond to a summons. And what this commandment is doing, as brief as it is, it's painting a picture. It's not an abstract principle. It's painting a picture. And here's the picture. It's a law court. And your neighbor has been brought into court over some issue. And you have been summonsed. You have been summonsed 
to give testimony in court. And your neighbor needs desperately that you give true testimony, that you say what you see and what you know, so that the court is in touch with reality, knows what really happened, sees what really is, and can make a just and fair decision. But if you're brought into that courtroom and you withhold the truth, either by lying or by making a factually accurate misleading statement or just by clamming up, your neighbor will be devastated because the judges will be out of touch with reality. Now, does this mean that this commandment, it's very interesting, isn't it? There's a little picture there. Does this mean this commandment is really only about court and law and oaths and legal stuff? And many people actually over the years had come to believe that. And when Jesus Christ began his ministry and he preached his famous Sermon on the Mount, he addressed that. At one point in the Sermon on the Mount, he addressed the fact that many people believed that this commandment was mainly talking, was only really talking about the court setting. And so many people said, well, the Ten Commandments says that you may not lie under oath. That when you're in the courtroom and you're under oath to God, swear to God, so help me God, then you may not lie. But outside of court, it's different. Things are different. And Jesus makes a fascinating statement. He says, don't make an oath. Don't swear by heaven, for it's God's throne. Don't swear by the earth, for it's God's footstool. Don't swear by your own hand, because God made it. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. And you know what's great about that? You know what? That's so radical. Here's what he's saying. He says, be logical. You're always in front of God. Every word you say, you're always standing in front of God. See? And therefore, as far as God is concerned, you're always under oath. And therefore, as far as God's concerned, you're always on the witness stand. And that means that if you lie, your neighbor will be devastated. The point of this commandment is human community is destroyed and individual people are destroyed if you don't tell the truth. If you don't do truth acts, if, you know, if you do not do truthful speech acts, human community in general and individual people in particular are destroyed because you're always under oath as far as God's concerned and you're always on the witness stand and, the people, and your neighbor will be devastated by false testimony under any circumstances. It's just as bad outside of court as inside court as far as God's concerned. You say, how's that true? Let's break that down. Number one, first of all, I said people need truth telling because Without it, human community is destroyed. Lewis Smedes, philosopher, theologian, puts it like this. He says, truthfulness is an invisible fiber that holds people together in humane community. When we cannot assume that people communicating with us are truthful, we cannot live with them in trust that they will respect our right to the freedom to respond to reality. Our right to the freedom to respond to reality. And if we cannot trust each other respect this basic right, we've lost our chance to be human together in God's manner. Speak the truth, be the truth, for your truth sets others free. Now, I talked this summer with some people who had been to a country for a while in which nothing in society worked. So, for example, they couldn't trust what the government told them about the water. The government said, the water's fine. They didn't trust the government. So what did that mean? They didn't use the water. They didn't wash very much. They didn't take showers. And as a result, they were constantly sick. They didn't trust building inspectors or construction people to build things according to normal codes of safety. So they build everything themselves. They don't trust doctors. Why? Because doctors usually have little signs up on their, uh, you know, uh, their wall, right? Don't you, doctors? And it says, see, I've been trained. I, was, I went through the accreditation possibilities. I've been trained. And they don't trust those things. They don't trust doctors to really been trained well. They don't trust the accreditation procedures in those, in those countries. They don't trust doctors. They don't trust lawyers. They don't trust the financial institutions to give them their money back after they've given it to them. They don't trust the papers to tell them what's true. All they trust is their family. They don't trust anyone. And therefore, nothing works. That's just what Lewis Mead said. But the Bible told us this before all. God made the world so that truth is the only way human community even begins to work. And every single time, Jesus is saying, you tell a lie. You're assaulting the very possibility of human community. Nobody has put this more eloquently than Vaclav Havel, the, most, the uh, former president of the Czech Republic, 
who wrote what many people consider the most significant political text in the 20th century, a little essay, not a little, but an essay called The Power of the Powerless. And in that essay, he brilliantly describes how, number one, the communist totalitarian regimes basically broke down because of a lack of truth, everybody telling lies to everybody. And then secondly, the only reason they even stayed up for so many years was because everybody told lies to everybody. And thirdly, the reason they all came down, the reason they all came down was that thousands of people decided to tell the truth. Truth is absolutely crucial to human community. And every time you tell a, tell a lie, you're actually hacking away at the very ground you stand on, the very possibility of humane community. But that's not all. It's not just <laughs> the truth. Uh, a lack of truth speech destroys human community, but a lack of truth speech enslaves individuals. Now, Lewis Smead said that when you tell a lie to an, a person, you enslave them, you deprive them from the freedom, the freedom to be in touch with reality. To be out of touch with reality is to be enslaved. To be in touch with reality is free. And when you lie, you're taking that freedom away, you're enslaving them. How does that work? Well, think actually about any lie at all. Let's just say you're selling a piece of property. And that property, you know, has a structural flaw in it, but you don't tell about it. You lie about it, you hide it. You're depriving the buyer of being in touch with what it's really gonna cost to own that piece of property. That buyer is out of touch with reality. That buyer is gonna make a decision out of touch with reality, and it'll probably be a devastating decision because afterwards he or she will find he can't afford it. Or I'm going to give you a to totally different realm. Let's just say you're a father and you've got a teenage daughter. And you outwardly say you're basically okay with how your teenage daughter is behaving, but inwardly you are disappointed and furious with her. You are depriving her of the freedom that she needs to be in touch with the reality of how her behavior affects people. She doesn't know how her behavior affects people. And as a result, you enslaved her. You've deprived her of that freedom and she's gonna have a terrible life. Now think, the buyer tells a lie because you want a better price. And the father hides, tells a lie because you just don't want the hassle of having to deal, talk to your daughter about this. But in both cases, what you're doing is you're advantaging yourself at a terrible cost to that person. The people that you're lying to, you're enslaving. You're, they're out of touch with reality. And because they're out of touch with reality, they're being devastated. You're on the witness stand and your neighbor is dying for a lack of truth. Your spouse is dying for a lack of truth. Your friends are dying for a lack of truth. Your, your sons, your daughters, your parents are dying for a lack of truth. Every time you lie to advantage yourself, you're enslaving them. That's why people need this. What does it look like to pursue justice in today's world? The Bible is a fundamental source for promoting justice and compassion for those in need. Discover a life of generous, gracious justice empowered by an experience of grace in Tim Keller's book, Generous Justice. As thanks for your gift to help share the gospel with others, we'll send you a copy of the book to enrich your perspective on what it means to pursue justice in today's world. Go to gospelandlife.com slash give and request yours today. That's gospelandlife.com slash give. Because the gospel changes everything. So that's what people need. <clears throat> and that's why they need it so much. What they need is truthful speech acts and that's why they need it so much. It's remarkable, isn't it? And now we come to the third point. And we come to the third point, hopefully by now you realize that there is no commandment, not certainly not this commandment, that you can look at and say, I do that all the time, I'm fine with that one. You're not fine with this one. We're not fine at all. You may have trouble keeping it um, between now and the time you get home. <laughs> very, very, very possible. And if it's really true, that, as Vaclav Havel says, that you know, one little lie doesn't mean very much. It, there's a terrific spot in Vaclav Havel's uh, 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 essay in which he talks about the green grocer, you know, just a, just a local grocery guy who just doesn't believe the rhetoric and doesn't believe, he, he knows how corrupt the regime is, but every single day he puts in his, uh, 
in, uh, a sign in his front window, Workers of the World Unite. He knows it's a crock, he knows it's stupid, but he just does it anyway. And uh, basically what Vaclav Havel says, that's what keeps a tyrannical regime into place and why people die. And when thousands of people say, I'm not going to put that out there, that's just a lie. It's not what the government stands for. It's not true. It's not what I believe. By, by a simple act of not lying, you can bring down tyranny. As, in other words, don't kid yourself. It's just a little lie. There is no such thing. Don't kid yourself that nobody knows. You're, you're hammering away at the fabric of your own life and the fabric of the whole universe and the fabric of the of your human community. So we're supposed to be telling the truth. It's not at all easy for us to tell the truth. We need it desperately. How do we become the kind of people who can do it? Now, the normal way we go about it, the normal way we try to make our children honest, the more, normal way we try to make ourselves honest is something like this. There's basically two ways, but they're similar. The one approach is to say, you better be honest because it pays. If you're dishonest, you'll get caught by God, by the inspector, by your boss, by the civil magistrate. And on the other hand, that says, well, so one of the things, be honest, otherwise, because honesty pays. So honesty, you know, is, is, otherwise you'll be caught. The other approach is to say, you don't want to be like those awful people who lie. Now, we use both with our kids. You say, if you do that, you're going to grow up to have a horrible life, you're going to be in jail. If you do that, God's going to send you to hell. If you do that, I'm going to smack you. If you do that, you know what it... The other thing is to say, we aren't that kind of person. We are the kind of pre people who tell the truth. Now, in both cases, what are you doing? You're saying, honesty pays you. It pays off in terms of practical safety and self-image. Honesty pays. Now, if that's the motive, and I would say it's the main way in which we train ourselves, it's the main way I was trained, it's the main way we, we, we work on ourselves to become honest, that won't work. It hasn't worked. Look at history. Look at the world. It hasn't worked, and here's why it doesn't work. The, tenth, the Ninth Commandment tells you the purpose and motive of truthfulness, the only motive of truthfulness that will make you truthful, the only motive, motive that really will do it, is concern for your neighbor. If you say, tell the truth because it pays in terms of personal safety or self-image, the time will inevitably come in which it doesn't pay. And you will be on the witness stand and your neighbor will be devastated if you tell the truth, if you don't tell the truth, but you will be devastated if you do. Your neighbor will be devastated if you don't tell the truth, but you will lose face. You will lose money. You will lose reputation. You will lose your job. You will lose your life if you do. What will happen when that happens? If the main reason why you're honest is because I don't want to go to hell, I don't want God to be unhappy with me, I don't want people to think badly of me, I like to think of myself well. If the main reasons for being honest is self-interest because it pays, then when, at some point you're going to get into one of those situations in which it will not pay, in which it will be very, very costly for you to tell the truth, and you're going to lie, you're going to cheat, you're going to embezzle, and you're going to be shocked at yourself. And you're going to be disappointed at yourself because you find out finally that you don't have what the psalmist said in Psalm 51, truth in the inward parts. How are we going to actually really become people that tell the truth, no matter what it costs? There's only one way, and it's the preamble. Never forget, never forget when you're reading the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments do not start, you shall have no other gods before me. It doesn't start that way, does it? It starts, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. It starts with a, pre a preamble. It starts with a prologue. It starts with a reminder of something. I am the Lord your God who saved you. I'm the Lord your God who broke into time and space with miraculous deeds in Egypt, and I liberated you. Therefore, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, because I liberated you, you must liberate your neighbor with the truth. Now, that's pretty powerful. It doesn't just simply say, tell the truth, because good people tell the truth, because it pays off, because it'll be good for your self-image, because I'll bless you and answer your prayers. That's not what God says. You tell the truth. Liberate your neighbor with the truth, because I liberated you in Egypt. Well, that's pretty powerful, but the readers of Deuteronomy only know of one place where God broke into history to liberate them. 
You and I know of another place where God came down into time and space and history and through great miraculous actions saved us, not just from economic and political bondage like in Egypt, but from sin and death itself. It was Jesus Christ. And near the end of it all, he was on trial for his life. And when Jesus was on trial for his life, as you remember, they brought in witnesses, false witnesses, to testify against him, their great neighbor, to devastate him. It's like a little parable of the human race. This is, this is, as Vaclav Havel says, this is what's wrong with us. This is why, this is why work, things don't work. This is the reason why civilization doesn't work. We don't tell the truth. And that's why we're all so miserable. And here's Jesus Christ coming right down in the middle of it and receiving all the same devastation of it that we do. But finally, he's brought before Pilate. And Pilate asks him a, que- asks him a question. Are you a king? And when Pilate asks him that question, that's the moment. This is the ultimate example of the ninth commandment. Because you see, if Jesus tells the truth, he's dead. If Jesus says, yes, I am a king, he can't do that. Not not before a Roman imperial governor. So if he tells the truth, he's dead. If he lies, or if he gives a factually accurate but misleading statement, like, well, I'm just king in people's hearts. (laughs) Or if he just shuts up. If Jesus withholds the truth, he lives. If Jesus tells the truth, he dies. But get this, he came to die for our sins, didn't he? He came to die for our lies. So if Jesus Christ lies and saves himself, we're lost. Oh, my word. Here is the ultimate witness in the ultimate courtroom And if he doesn't tell the truth, at infinite cost to himself, we're devastated. But what does he do? In John 18, he says, And Jesus answered Pilate, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate sneered. And proceeded to put him to death. Now here it is. Here it is. There's two ways to look at that. There's two ways to look at Jesus Christ telling the truth. And paying the ultimate cost for us. The one is to look at it just as an example. You say, oh, there's Jesus Christ and he's doing what we're supposed to do. He's telling the truth no matter what it costs. I better be like him or God won't accept me. I better be like him or God won't bless me. And if you do that, what you're doing is you're filling yourself with fear. You're saying, I think I can do it. I think I can do it. Maybe I can do it. You're thinking of yourself. You're saying, I want to tell the truth so that I will feel good about myself, so I will go to heaven, so God will accept me, so I... And you will fail. You will have to fail. But if you see him, not just doing that as an example, but as a savior, if you say, when you're tempted to lie, and you will be tempted to lie, if you think of his sacrificial, saving, truth-telling for you at infinite cost to himself, out of infinite love for you. You'll have everything you need because that destroys fear. You know, if, you're tempted to, if you're tempted to lie, it's only because at that moment you're afraid of something. You're afraid of losing face. You're afraid of losing money. You're afraid of losing power. You're afraid of losing advantage in some way. And you say, but look what he's done for me. What this means is he delights in me. He loved me to hell and back unconditionally. He delights in me. I can lose this approval if I've got that approval. I'm going to live with him forever. I can can lose that wealth if I've got that wealth. When you're tempted to lie, if you're about to lie, you say, I'm forgetting what he did for me. He lost everything to tell the truth for me. I can lose this little bit to tell the truth for him and for my neighbor. And I will. Only if you see the saving, sacrificial, truth-telling of Jesus Christ on your behalf will you be happy enough and secure enough to be truth-tellers yourself. Then you'll have truth in the inward parts. And you know, Havel is absolutely right in saying, if you want to understand, you, you want to know what hell is, hell is a place where nobody ever tells the truth about anything. 
And you can see semi-hells in parts of the world where you can't trust anybody to ever tell you anything but just exploit you. But do you realize what the opposite would be? A community of human beings in which everyone tells the truth. And nobody spins and nobody exaggerates. And nobody's misrepresenting. And people are transparent and people are speaking the truth in love. We are called to be a community like that in the middle of New York City, which is not a place that's known for telling the truth. It would be heaven to live in a community like that. And we're called not only to be that community, but we're given the resources to do it. Let's take them up. Let's be that. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that uh, your son, Jesus Christ, answered truthfully on the witness stand. So we were saved. And we pray that now, for the rest of our lives, we'll never forget that. And we'll realize that every single time we're in a place in which we might lie or might tell the truth, we're standing before you, we're on the witness stand, our neighbors will die without our uh, truth-telling, and we will have the joy and the uh, fearlessness and the security to tell the truth because we remember Jesus doing it for us. And so we ask that you would help us to know not only how to build a community inside like this, but we could, that we could take this new security and truthfulness out into the world around us and be a witness to the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Gospel and Life podcast. We hope Dr. Keller's teaching inspired you to live out God's call to walk humbly with him while pursuing justice and loving mercy. And don't forget to follow Gospel and Life on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for more encouraging content. Thanks again for listening to Gospel and Life.